Okay, let's do this. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. Today is, um, in some sense, the 700th episode of Mr. Within, uh, the Mr. Within's Gift Channel. And um, <coughs> I wanted to speak about a notion where I find it's very interesting. Um, the title of today's episode is Frozen Thought. It should be Frozen Thoughts, actually. Frozen Thoughts in Space and Time. Let me see if I can refresh this. Okay. Um, the idea kind of follows from this notion that everything in this world of ours changes. Um, this world works in a way where in some sense I consider there to be an objective aspect and a subjective aspect to the moment. The objective aspect doesn't move like the body does. It instantly appears. That means thoughts, You like when, whenever you, like how would I say it, it's like, um, the same intention that moves my hand when I want like, like this cup of orange juice here in front of me, when my hand reaches to it, with the same instantaneousness, a sort of context arises in my mind. So it's kind of like uh, the individual aspect of the intelligence is meant to work with concepts and uh, uh, sort of boundaries. And in some sense, uh, the, what we consider to be the subjective intelligence, the mind, is kind of meant to work with, uh, uh, how can I say it, it animates the context. So right now as I'm speaking, like you're listening to Mr. Within, so this is the concept, okay? But the context is, is what you're actually here to hear. In other words, um, how would I say it? Like, Pretty much the surface and the essence, the personality and the presence. Your personality is conceived. Your presence is the context of your personality, which is the world. Frozen thoughts in space and time is a suggestion that we, in our lifetime, sometimes hold on to a sort of subjective uh, positioning of reality more than actually paying attention to the objective. Any time in this lifetime I have wanted the world to listen to my mind. When I was younger, it was uh, I could tell you all children are kind of raised with a spoiled mentality until the chaos uh, 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 reshapes them in their own eyes. And so... Seldom it is said, but the world that man is in is shaped by man. It is given value by man. That means we are kind of like, uh, I remember saying this very unique statement where I said imagination is organized and given reality. For example, when you are writing a, let's say, mathematics exam or something, you begin to see there is a sort of data given, but yet you also need to bring in something from your free will to solve the solution. And kind of how life is is that our objective position is given. It is only in our subjectivity that we have a sort of power, uh, power of movement. So what I mean by that is that uh, not only in our subjectivity, I'm not talking about like, uh, I'm talking about the notion that the mind can move before the body does. What, what is that movement like? How is that movement? And for me, the mind, it's very unique. Just like the body changes position, the mind changes design. There have been moments I've been alive on this planet where the design of the world was incomprehensible. There's been moments where it was comprehensible. And I began to see that the mind is endlessly generating itself in a world that it has to content, constantly maintain in certain values. So you see, it kind of has to do with your inner sense of value, uh, how outer value arises in your experience. There was a time where... I felt um, 
the system of the world was wrong. And then something occurred that I realized, no, the system I was looking at the world was wrong. And it kind of brings this kind of situation where the world is too big to change individually, yet the individual is contributing to something. We are more than statistics on this planet. We are uh, intelligent, active. We are activated uh, consciousness on this planet. When I say activated, that means the design was being made. That means the humanity is a cake that was in the oven for, the billion year, for a billion years, you know, this current state of humanity. What the child finds in this life is that as consciousness establishes itself into an individual persona, this individual persona begins playing with itself through memory and through generation of self. You see, it's like small cells, they really replicate themselves to become bigger cells. You know, in, in, the way the intelligence of this world is working is that it is copying its dimensions until it evolves into a greater dimension. For me, nature has two positions. Either it is a collective intelligence, or it is an individual intelligence, or it is an incomprehensible, potentially either intelligence. So what that means is that uh, you can say a person will feel there's, there's kinds of emptiness, there's different kinds of emptiness, you know, because we have access to an objective uh, self and a subjective self. Uh, we begin to see the objective self brings with it the objective world. The laws of the objective world are fixed. Nature's laws are happening, like you can't avoid gravity, you know. So objectively, you're meant to learn from the world and listen to the world, to the physical world. You have to have a sort of unique alertness of constantly updating the way you exist to yourself physically, okay. But non-physically, this is where the juice of the talk is. This is where I'm, I get really fascinated because non-physically... Uh, the, the self that you see brings with itself an instantaneous world, but the self with, within changes. So I'll give you an example. Um, uh, the, a person, let's say his job is to, let's say an Uber driver, okay? That person suddenly gets in his car, puts the Uber thing on, and it starts the Uber drive, okay? The moment he's driving, he's in some sense doing a professional work, okay? Because he's doing his professional work, his personality is not the same as he is when he's in his living room. You see, like a person at work is not the same way they are. They don't have the same freedom of mind when they are sh uh, in the shower singing. You see? So in some sense, it's as if we walk through v different variations of the self. Let's say you have an unchanging self. This is your awareness. Okay, this is like how there is some part of you just watching things. And then there is some part of you which is the things being watched. One of these things being watched is your body. Okay? And because you claim this body, so pretty much it's very hilarious. It's like when a person says, I own this object, what they're saying is that the thought that is present as their conscious activity is choosing to claim what is in the consciousness. Wisdom commands us to recognize that we're in a changing world. Because we're in a changing world, that means you're not in this life to only see fullness. You know, you can run away from misery as much as you want, but you got to look at it. It's like that kid in the, uh, on the test exam who doesn't want to look at the problem and uh, even attempt it or understand it or comprehend it, regardless of the training. So what I'm trying to tell you is that your eyes have opened in a world where it is conditional. The physical reality, the objective self as I speak of, is, is conditional. It is based on the conditions of a greater system. But in regards to your mind, your mind can attain an unconditional position. This is why when, I, when yoga and meditation came into my mind, like when the concept arose, it was incredible. It was incredible because for the first time I found a way since I remember since the age of 11 guys I've been wondering like I was introduced to the idea of the soul very early on so it was never something shocking. Suddenly acknowledging the fact that you could be an ever present intelligence eternal intelligence it wasn't that shocking it was kind of boring. It's kind of boring when you realize you're an eternal being. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
you know, the guy got enlightened. They told him what happened. He's like, I just got bored, man. It's, that's the nature of the world. You got to do new things. And what that means is every gener generation commands a new performance. I find ourselves all to be actors. We are all actors, to each other at least. We can never see through each other's eyes. That means as I'm speaking, you can never see how I'm saying these words with what intensity of experiential engagement in this lifetime I'm saying these words. And similarly, I cannot know how you're hearing it. Okay, so this is the playful situation of uh, there being one world, but because of the design of the instrument of awareness of these creatures on this planet, there's many worlds in one world. That means there isn't one Earth, there is 8 billion and growing plus dimensions of Earth, various angles that the world is being animated. You see, it's pretty much phenomena, this phenomena is evoked into movement. You see, magic, what we think is magic, what we think back in the day was magic and super, like superstition or whatever, was their attempts at any tool to advance their awareness of what is here. You don't understand. Language entered man's minds. In early times, people understood this and they manipulated it. That's why we have spelling. That's why in magic there's spells. You know what that means? <laughs> That means, like, I'll tell you, it's like, imagine you lie to someone. Did you know lying is, is like magic? It is, it, is, it, is, it is an illusion. It is created, like, the first simulation that man created was the first person who ever lied. You know? <laughs> you know, it's a subjective linguistic simulation. It is a way the world is given shape without it actually being shaped that way. And the alertness to discover your true nature is just the opportunity of your lifetime. That means I realize you can never, I understood this very early on, even before I gave these talks, you can never teach anyone anything. Did you know that? You can never teach anyone anything. Galileo even said this. He said, <laughs> you can never teach anyone anything. You can make it only realize it within themselves. And this was a riddle for me because I'm like, how would people realize something they only have access to. And I realize it's these boring ass stories the civilization, uh, the civilization in its educational system feeds people. People do not have honor for life. They don't honor living. This is why they allow themselves to enter depression, stress. You enter depression and stress just like how you enter uh, uh, in a, an inefficient state of mind. Do you know, it's as if if you don't wear shoes and you walk on the beach or like on Lego, <laughs> you know, it's like, regardless, you're, you're not noticing something about how the world is. Therefore, there is no way you can make that adjustment to how the world is. So for me, it was all about vision. It was, I recognize the mind is here. That was my first proof. That means my first proof for divinity was the questioner. But then the second proof for divinity came was in some sense how there was movement prior to knowledge. You see, trust me, it's like, this is what they say, when you reverse engineer something, you will understand how it works. Okay, so similarly how it was engineered. So similarly, Mr. Within is saying this whole thing about yoga and meditation, guys, it's another way of saying rever uh, have a self-inquiry, reverse engineer into what it really means to be yourself. If you have any level of fear, enlightenment is, is the walk for the fearless. It is the last walk of the lifetime. It is the notion that the person is willing to allow their thoughts to move at the speed of life, hence being incomprehensible to the presence. So there will be ways that your, the thought of you will seem so fast because the thought of you is a reflection. You are identifying with phenomena. The yogic mind in its advanced stages did not identify with phenomena. It was the identifier, it was the mover. It was the mover of worlds before the world had to move something for the person as if a prayer needed to be answered. You see, it is, it is the responsibility we take for the care we have. It is all observations. It is all observations. We can say on some level we are creatures on a rock in the middle of nowhere. This, this cosmos we're calling cosmos, we gave it a name. What, what does that mean? That means the explorations have not been successful. And that means just like that Attack on Titan anime show, the Survey Corps has been going outside, but they have not been making advancements. It is only when man 
when the person begins to value the importance of a temporary opportunity in an eternal process. I say something, I say that I believe the concept of eternity is, it was also introduced in Charles Darwin's evolution. He was speaking about eternity. The same way Plato said time was the moving image of eternity is the same way we can say Charles Darwin saw this, uh, this animal evolving. When you looked at the experience of the animal evolving, the animal was like this temporary form that is and eternally wanting to present an effort to exist. Okay, you, you don't know it. Most people, they, when, you, have, when the, you don't have enough problems in life, you don't care about being an answer in life. Most people want answers. They need answers. When have they ever wondered that they are the answer? There was the Sufi dervish mystic poet by the name of Rumi. You know what he says? He says, I was not, I, I have, uh, he says, I have, um, I have, uh, God, what's the exact saying? He says, I have lived on the edge of insanity on the lip of insanity, wanting to know reasons, knocking on a door. The door opens. It opens. I have been knocking from the inside. What that means is it is the ultimate revelation of the spiritual seeker, that you cannot seek the spirit. It is a fool's errand. It is, it is by definition inconceivable. It's attributeless. It's like somebody is like, I'm looking for treasure. And his friends are like, okay, man, we'll help you. We're supportive friends, you know. So what's this treasure? And the guy's like, oh, my treasure is I'm trying to find emptiness, guys. And then his friends were like, how could you find emptiness? <laughs> you know, it's like his friends are like, guys, we need an intervention, you know. Billy here needs to, is trying to find e emptiness. We don't know how to, how we can help him you know <laughs> and so you see you can't find emptiness you can't find something that 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 you don't have a reference for you just don't know what you're looking for so you'll believe anything and that is the problem you see humanity it's very hard i figured it out i was for a long time i was like okay what's going on here why why aren't people uh, why, why isn't the intelligence of the human being activated? That means prior to the idea of the soul, the idea of the mind entertained me. At the age of 11, I heard this kind of notion that uh, like a very limited percentage of the brain is actually being activated for existence to occur. That means our frontal lobe is activated, right? When we look at the evolution of the brain, we see various timelines to developments of, of the brain, of the human brain. That means our human brain right now is dope. <laughs> You know, as, as the modern poets say, you know. <laughs> I wondered if we're using only 10 to 12 percent or whatever amount, 10 to 20 percent of the brain, you know, which seems to be the frontal lobe area, where is the rest? Okay, what, what, how do we access the full potential? Because as a kid, I like puzzles, guys. I was drawn to the idea of the mind prior to the idea of the soul because their seem, mind seemed to be the mystery to the soul. That means in trying to figure out my mind, I seem to be getting closer to where the answers for consciousness were. But the issue with consciousness is not that it can't be proven or it can't be formulated. I have hope for neurology, even though that hope is on thin ice. <laughs> but... <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is that I, I thought... The riddle was this, the early Rubik's Cube of the mind, the mystery of consciousness. For me, when I was like around the age of 11, I was wondering how do I access, let's say, the other 90 or 80 percent of the brain that is not inactive? How can I see? Like I was trying to imagine who I would be as a person if I had access to all of my mind, okay? The full potential of the brain. And... I couldn't conceive it. I couldn't, I had no clue. That remained a mystery for, I think, the next, like, 15 years after that day. You know? 
not 15 years, the next 10 years after that day. But, but, but the thing is, the answer that came to me was a collective intelligence. So I realized, holy shit, if I'm choosing, my free will is choosing to be a person, this mold of a person is an attraction to a certain aspect of the mind. That means it's, it, human beings have not even cared to go on such errands, on such journeys, but in some sense, I find that one day it will happen. One day we will have children in educational systems. Uh, suddenly the teacher is giving the most ordered, elegant, most like, you know, routine curriculum based suddenly teaching. And suddenly the student starts, one student starts banging on his table and the teacher is like, what are you doing? You're disturbing the class. And the student says, you have no class. <laughs> and so it's the notion of liberation. That means honesty gave you access to data that dishonesty never thought you deserved. You don't understand. We're data processing creatures. So it's the quality of the data that enters your experience. So it's your, how your mind is that is going to suggest how the world can be. So in order to find your mind, the mind has been kept mysterious to us because of its definitioning. Because of how they put it in definition, because of how they categorized and fed you a sort of structure to the intelligence of your being. You see, the only structure, the only classification I have dared give the mind is that it works with the known and the unknown. What is known is object, the objective self. What is unknown is the subjective self and beyond. It is, that, it is like in some ways your intelligence is the ocean. In some ways it is the currents in the ocean moving. You, 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 are, you fragment reality because you have to, because your identity will not exist if the world is not made into bit, bits and pieces. Okay? That is the thing about language. This is why people who fundamentally work with this belief, I realize I cannot change the world. Who am I to change the world? But I can give mirrors to people, <laughs> you know. Imagine this prophet came on this earth, okay, and this prophet was super relaxed. <laughs> this prophet, people ask them, what's your super revelation? What's the secrets, man? Spill out the beans, the divine beans, spill them out, you know. And he said, in some sense... <laughs> He said, there's nothing I can give you. There's nothing you can get outside. Believe it or not, there's, this world is infinitely manifesting externally. But when you wonder, as a mental creature, what its value is, its value has to do with your experience. Your experience, its borders are subjective and objective. Okay? So let's say imagination is a nation of images. This nation of images somehow contained... Uh, I know how it's contained, but it cannot be explained how it's contained. <laughs> so, so some things, it's not like people don't know. It's just that the language is not there yet. Our language is so limited. There are two things that are not evolving as fast as the experience and the imaginative, uh, the subtler planes of the individual. It is politics, our political systems, and it is our language systems. Language and politics is changing slower than the actual person's mind and taste for life. And the, that means the user it, the it interface, the user interface, how can I say it? It's like your computer, not your computer, that's not a good example. Let me say it like this. It's like something that you're using is not evolving and adjusting to you faster than you are evolving and adjusting to it. Eventually, you're going to find yourself in life where you're going to notice patterns of intelligence where you are much ahead of. And you're going to notice patterns of intelligence where you are much behind of. And then you're going to discover this sort of axis. Imagine like this giant, <laughs> like this bamboo stick, okay, light bamboo stick. Imagine it was balanced on your head. Okay, stretching from your left side to your right side, this long bamboo stick was just balanced on your head. So what that means is I want you to imagine a spectrum to yourself. Every person conceives their own. Naturally, it happens because you give words meaning. But at the same time, <laughs> Mr. Witten is going to say this spectrum of self is very crucial because the deepest depths of yourself is kind of like if I imagine I took a paintbrush, put it in paint, and suddenly just like, you know, like a sword kind of stabbed the, 
uh, stab the, what do you call it, the canvas uh, with my paintbrush as if my paintbrush was a sword. Suddenly you will notice in that brush stroke, there are parts of the brush stroke that are lighter the, and there are parts of the pr brush stroke where the immediacy of the paint is contacted first. This is simply a metaphor for me to say that there are aspects to your experience right now as a self where are they are conscious, they are in view, they are dense. You can acknowledge it, know it, and evidentially work with it. But there are aspects to your intelligence that are unknown. There are like the lighter parts of the brush strokes. There are the mysteries of conception and matter. Pretty much people are asking two kinds of, all philosophy comes down to this. Uh, was matter here first or consciousness? If consciousness was here first, the unknown wins. If matter was here first, the known wins. Uh, if, each have each, if the known wins or the unknown wins, nothing happens. There's no progress. You know why? Because we are putting life into the world. This is why honesty was important. Honesty was not for others mainly. It was for the individual. Without honesty, you will never get access to your true intelligence. I'm telling you, live a lie as much as you want. Live in a world of lies as much as you want. But there will come a day where you will suddenly see uh, the, the alarm clock, uh, the, the alarm for the, your mortal life. The, I call it the mortal alarm. Okay, this alarm clock suddenly ringing. This alarm clock that suddenly rings, the person presses snooze. The person presses snooze. He chooses to avoid the urgency of having to muster up all your effort to live in a new way. You see, life is not about just accumulation. People who get caught into that mentality, they become wealthy, they become extremely rich, but internally they, they, feel, they will feel a stranger to the world they never cared for. That is, that is an inner tragedy. When you feel you are not allowed in this life. That is what I'm trying to eradicate. Any self-induced limitation. We have no time. We have no time for misery in a burning world, unfortunately. See, the thing is, earth is neither hell or heaven. Earth is, in some sense, uh, a battlefield. It's a battlefield we're in. We don't recognize it. I say battlefield to inspire a, a sort of honorable uh, vision, but at the same time, I see it as a playground as well. That means, you know what it is, when chaotic things happen, I'm like, okay, chaos, thanks for coming into my view, but I see the order already. When order things happen, I'm like, thanks, order, for coming into my view, but I see the chaotic things already. So it's kind of like, you, if you notice the wise man, the sage, it's, this, it's like it was the archetype of the character that paid attention. That's it. You will see any person in your class uh, who is getting, uh, who is, you got, look at people's attention. Their attention is their, it, it is like, if they say, uh, uh, the eyes are the window of the soul, the attention is the door to the soul, okay? <laughs> oh, man. What kind of world do we live in where our eyes open just to see themselves closed? we must build. This is why I will always recommend people to go study Buckminster Fuller. I want people, I want the children of the future generations to give a shit about their societies and civilization. I want there to be this efficiency that will arise to just, you. it's like, it's not a waking up. It's not like some, like the concept of enlightenment, by the way, guys, it just means waking up. Okay. This is why you can wake up in an instant or your dream can be eons. It doesn't matter you know, how you, it's, it, your soul remembers itself. This, they had this in yoga and Vedanta. It was very incredible. It's, uh, it was this notion that the first task of the, uh, of the truth seeker, yogi means truth seeker in another way. Sadhu means like truth seeker. And so the truth seeker now 
when you, not now, but at that time was advised that the first thing you do is you got to discover your divine remembrance. When I say divine remembrance, some people are going to be like, holy shit, is that my past lives? <laughs> it's not. But don't, don't get alarmed. Past lives is the right step towards it. You see, for me, it's not about discovering, uh, in some sense, other dimensions. It is about whatever data you have now, finding its clarity, finding its design. This is, the, this is a sort of courage that is necessary for evolution. It is the courage to see something you, don't, you can't do anything about but still go on. That's exploration. I am talking to those kind of people. If you don't value exploration as a priority of your civilization, you, you, will, you won't care for the group dynamic. You will not care for your world. Very easy because you feel it's going nowhere. It is only the effort of the unknown. The unknown is our savior. Our Savior is in, is, it cannot be found in books. It, believe it or not, it cannot be found anywhere in our knowledge. Our Savior is the unknown. Because when we look at the unknown, we're like, oh my God, all we know is not all we know. Suddenly comes the awakening, the recognition that man has been fighting himself only to recognize his Savior was also himself. That means you, there, a part of you doesn't have to just uh, engage with intensity, a part of you has also also be able to disengage with intensity. Trust me, it is how you react to intensity because you can sit here and you can tell me I am like the calmest. Like you, you imagine like you were sitting here, like I'm on sitting on my porch at the table. Imagine you were sitting here, and if you were sitting here, you could tell me you are the most calm person ever or something. But I will, I will see that calmness. Where is it rooted? Is it rooted in a contemplation of reality or is it rooted in a, in, a, in, a, in a mask? It's very easy to put a mask on the world. We do it all the time. This is why to be truly spiritual means to be attributeless. It doesn't mean to be filled with attributes. This is why I say past lives cannot be... It, when I say your divine remembrance, it is not your past life. It is not like you suddenly open up this photo album in the depths of your mind of every moment you've existed as a form, you know? It's that you eventually realize the responsibility of the moment is awareness. Awareness is free. That means I'm asking you right now, you tell me, do you value freedom? Right now, like, if, if, like I don't know who you are listening, but wherever you are in the world, there was a time where human beings didn't, couldn't just relax. They couldn't have space. They were constantly, first they, they had to get out of the animal kingdom. We had to get out of the food chain. We got out of the food chain. Then we, got out, we recognized humans now had to fight each other. First we had to fight off other animals, you know, as a species. Then now we, we've gone into a sense where we have to now fight each other's animal nature. This is the kind of chaotic motivation of society. That means we are not perfect. That means it is said it is human to make errors. It is to her is to be human. So this humanity is not perfect. It is not imperfect either. What do we do? We have to recognize. We have to give it some value and then move. That's it. I am telling you, this is the difference between... I saw it in the mentality of all the greatest uh, characters and many stories around the world, both fiction and nonfiction, where it was a suggestion of the greatness of the king. That means, you know who became a king? It wasn't somebody who, like, killed everybody and scared everybody into being a powerful being. That is not power. That is, that is insanity. That is somebody freaking out about their ability, so they're in some sense have to steal the world's ability. It is, it is tragic. Human beings are living on this planet in inefficient ways more than efficiency. Now we have to turn the table. We have to turn the odds. We have to build heaven in hell. That's what I'm telling you. We have to build heaven in hell. And we have to recognize, we have to take the world into a neutral state. The world is given too much imagery. This is what the educational system, it should be, it's one of its purposes, but it doesn't understand to keep the clarity of knowledge intact. But it will not. Because let me tell you, it's where the money goes nowadays. <laughs> 
where the money goes, people give a shit. That's it. That, that's what I've realized. You know, the money is not power. Money is care. People care when money is involved. You're in, like somebody who's violent. You suddenly say, hey, man, I'll give you this amount of thing. Go uh, do that job. And suddenly the person, suddenly his violence has gained because he feels as far as his world is concerned, he's getting a win-win mentality. So what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, the mind animates itself in many ways. It animates itself in many relationships. Uh, I, I got caught personally into some of these relationships. I had to break them because I noticed the world would break them eventually. When the, the Sufi mystic, the, the, you know, uh, you can say ancient Persian mysticism uh, met philosophically is similar to a sort of Japanese like not just ancient Persian, just ancient, the notion of mysticism is kind of similar to the Japanese uh, notion of Harakiri. I don't believe Harakiri was meant to be a physical action. It didn't have to be, okay? But I don't know that much about Japanese history to properly comment either. So what I will tell you is that I know, I know the action. I know in some sense it was why it was done. It was done so that the free will of the individual dismantles the physical process. That means you, you don't enter the other world with fear. You enter it with the last action of your free will. You find contentment in, in moments of living. That's all you can do. That's all you can be, believe it or not. You, can, you have to look at the world. It will be a certain way. You acknowledge it. You experience it. Then you accept it and you move. All right? That quality that all the great kings had was a sort of vision. It was a vision of alertness and awareness, as if the commander, like I, I saw this, and um, it's like the, the person who's meant to lead is the one who is aware of more of the setting than the others. So when you become aware of more of your setting than how your personality it contains it, then your personality will feel void to you. Anytime your experience evolves prior to your conceptual or subjective evolution of it, 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 it's very unique. It's as if like, uh, trust me, there's sometimes your mind just needs to get updated. It doesn't matter when you updated it. You know, it's like up installing the newest patch of iTunes or something, you know. So it's one of those things where the update, once you get the new update, it doesn't matter how you update it or not. The past becomes meaningless when the future succeeds. That means if, let's say, the world doesn't, they say 99.9% .9 of species go extinct, but I don't know how many percentage of species who make, like, you know, incredible technologies go extinct. Who knows? <laughs> Meister Eckhart said, uh, sorry, not Meister Eckhart, Friedrich Nietzsche, this German philosopher, he said, God is dead and we killed him. And it took me a while to be like, what did he mean? I can understand how God is dead. People no longer care for the idea. But I, I can't see how we killed it. I couldn't understand it. And then I eventually understood it. It was we killed uh, the notion of the unknown moving us. Our free will is based on knowledge. If I ask you, if imagine there, you could have three options, which one would you choose? Would you choose uh, complete knowledge, uh, complete health, or complete ability? Which one? You notice if you had knowledge, you would learn to have all of them. Knowledge is... The, great, the best way so far your mind is conceiving this. Do you see? I have an exp a, a kind of explorer's attitude with my own intelligence. Okay? And I feel everybody should start studying their mind. This is something every teacher should have said. But no, they like writing words on walls, you know? <laughs> I believe YouTube was the greatest development. I find you YouTube to be a miracle. I find it to be a freedom of the deeper levels of how language can evolve for our civilization, how communication will evolve, how knowledge will 
find its edge and move beyond. Whether it was Theoden King from Lord of the Rings 3 movie, you know. That moment suddenly beating the first army that was attacking that nice looking castle connected to the mountain. Theoden suddenly sees those giant mammoths and so you can see the actor is brilliant. The actor does this expression like, oh, fuck, giant mammoths. Now I gotta, we got to kill giant mammoths, you know? And the king just for a second, you see his hopelessness influence him only a millisecond and suddenly he looks at his men and he's on the horse and he says, charge, okay? He says, we go, you know? And they, like, they sound the horns and they march. That's the, that's the greatness of the efficiency of the, of the human being. We don't recognize it. It's our group dynamics that make us incredibly powerful. It is our group mentalities, our group abilities that have made us suddenly come out of the food chain. When our minds do not fight, but they invent, they integrate. This integration does not mean dissolution of the individual, individual, it means embrace of the collective. That's it. You don't have to want to, you don't have to change to be a part of this world, but you have to acknowledge how it's changing to be a part of this world. As frozen thoughts in space and time melt, weakness dissolves in the discovery of new strength. I feel you, it, this is my claim, this is what I'm saying, this is what this part of the world is saying, um, this part of the world that I'm existing in right now, like this exact physical. <laughs> we are not thoughts, we think we are thoughts, because we think we are thoughts, we have stopped wondering how a thought can think. Because we have stopped wondering how a thought can think, our educational system has accepted a limited way of approaching knowledge. We, we are teaching kids con concepts, but we're not teaching them the context those concepts have value in. This is why children in the educational system, they're like, I learned a lot of stuff I would never use. I'd be like, okay, because you don't know the context to apply them, you know? It's like the moment you learn mathematics and the moment the child learned to count, suddenly it could see a pattern in an objective phenomena that it could not see before. You see, you, 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 you stretch the inner world through a, a authentic wonder of your own intelligence. And let me tell you, and you know how an intelligent being, I find, perceives their intelligence? Unknown. They, they don't know. They can, they, they can never measure. They can't measure a dynamic living phenomena. You can't measure a process that's active, you know? I'm telling you, what you measure is the limitations of your own measurement. That's it. It's like, I, it's not me. It's like, it's, it's not my opinion that I say, I don't like rulers. It's just that rulers break by nature. Nature provides the measurement, the value. There was uh, another leadership uh, leader archetype I'm going to get into. Um, there, so we had Theoden King kind of in a hopeless moment, fearlessly advancing. Then we had this commander in a Attack on Titan, which is by far my favorite show, even though it's in the Japanese kind of um, unique kind of art brought to life, you know. There is a commander named Commander Erwin in, in, uh, in this anime show called Attack on Titan. And this commander is in this situation where he has one objective to save this person who's been taken by these beasts, by these abomination kind of level giants. And so he just looks at his men and he says, give your hearts, we are charging. And uh, Sorry, sorry, this is how the scene begins. I'm going to tell you the exact scene. So... Um, Suddenly, some situation happens where one of the comrade, one of the soldiers, looks at Commander Erwin and says, "Is this hell?" Like they're seeing something chaotic. These giants killing one another, and suddenly the commander's like, "No, this is hell!" And he says, "Charge!" And suddenly the men charge, 
and he says we our objective is to save that one important person and uh, in some sense retreat okay and so while he's charging while, while this commander Erwin is having his theater and king moment suddenly as he's running one of these giants just bites his arm and suddenly every his whole army is moving forward but a giant has just killed their commander not just killed him like it's bit in his right arm and he the commander with his left hand is just like uh, the, the he's like he says advance like he's not giving up you see as if the, it's as if the body the guy's body got destroyed but the will of his mind was was there his, his mind was still charging at that battlefield even though his body was held back right so it was so what I'm trying to tell you is like there's levels of the experience of the moment where uh, it, it's very unique it's not super analytical and it's not at the same time super irrational it has to do with a balanced approach and this balanced approach usually happens from first recognizing how you are so imagine you don't know yourself how do you figure out who you are you go and sit still and silent somewhere in nature and just stay there don't do anything don't have thoughts don't even think of meditation don't think of any philosophy concept or anything just be a moment and then you'll see the simplicity that your mind can acknowledge and then once you are you see how simple your mind can be then then it fearlessly entertains the complex that means trust me the fool saw things that the most intelligent could not that is why the fool then became no longer a fool so what, what I'm telling you is that the world is opening up to people's eyes life is like this long dream okay it's like this long dream where it's bit by bit day by day levels of it uh, details of it open up the details of it usually is in nature hand so we can say that before human beings think about their purpose nature based on their design has given them their purpose okay this argument can be made but we see we are free will the free will is here the free will is like somebody is that invited to the party of manifestation and is just chilling there is in there in the house so eventually people acknowledge the person and see what, it, what what's going on right certain mystics uh, acknowledged that um, your ego, the notion of the ego, Osho, for example, was one of these people. He acknowledged that the ego was like snow in the melting sun. That means so they asked Sadhguru and they told him, uh, what is enlightenment? Okay, they said, can a person get enlightenment? And Sadhguru said, enlightenment occurs at the time of death. Okay, this yogi, this so so considered enlightened yogi, can, said, enlightenment occurs at the moment of death. And uh, <laughs> somebody, because it, it was hilarious, this guy Sadhguru is 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 like the man is a cosmic comedian, you know, in some manner. He, uh, some kid comes and asks this very wise man Sadhguru. He comes and asks him. He's like, hey, what happens after death? And Sadhguru looks at him and says, some things are best left to experience personally. <laughs> and so he tells the kid, he says, the question you're asking, you're not asking it even properly. You have not truly wondered what, his, what life is to even ask that question, what is death? You're, you haven't seen enough life to even want to know what death is. That's what, the, what Sadhguru kind of told the guy indirectly. There comes a sort of transparency to the personality once the personality wonders how it's kept. Carl Jung wondered how the personality was kept, the conscious person, and in some sense he tapped into uh, the context of the concept of self. And he recognized the context of self, of this concept of self, the ego. In some uh, not the ego, sorry, uh, that's Freud. Um, I'm talking about Carl Jung, so uh, the conscious, the conscious mind. 
So he suddenly, uh, the unconscious mind, in some sense, he suddenly gave, suddenly tapped into the unconscious mind. He recognized what was floating in his unconscious were memories. Each memory was kept through a design of a certain pattern of identity. So that means is that in this lifetime, your attention, it has been permeating through all design. You're, you don't know it, but you are so incredibly filled with various designs. Your mind is a storehouse of various ways the world has moved in your vision. Now, this storehouse house is not a given access to you know why because you're choosing to be in a certain way your uncertainty has led to fear and fear has stopped the progress of the true evolution our fixed views can only get fixed when we recognize the law of change guys it's not my truth I I, I entertained many fantasies I dwindled in ways that the world was, I, like I was living in, in ways, like when I was younger, I did not see the cruelty of the world. It was kind of like every child is like, like has the experience Buddha did when he stepped out of his kingdom. He begins to see the reality of suffering. And you know, where can you go? <clears throat> when can you go when you see the misery of your species? What can you do about it? You know, is it enough to just uh, st sit in your own cube and not wonder? The world changes. So that means if every day I came and gave the same talk, it would never be the same talk. It's very funny. It's like sci uh, scientists don't realize the religious mentality took billions of years to evolve. It's a product of nature. When you resist nature, you forget. It's like you've gone into, you are invited somewhere, and you're destroying the person's house. You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> when we realize nature was here first. Do you know how much peace you will experience just by understanding that truly? That nature was here first. Your heart is beating naturally. Your breathing happens naturally. I also realize speech and many things can also work with natural rhythms. The free will, has, to, has in order to separate itself from the world, has had to e avoid nature. You don't understand. Our subjective evolution is based on the fact that we are not nature. Did you know that a part of your intelligence right now is endlessly till the end of time telling itself it is not nature? And there is a part of your intelligence which evidentially is definitely nature. Okay, so we are in some sense the unnatural mind set in the natural world. And guys, it says there's two people watching, so don't be shy. Feel free to comment and engage with this conversation these these talks i'm giving it's not i'm giving it to certain specific someone i'm just revealing a landscape which i want to see how others envision it because we understand what is more valuable than green pieces of paper in our pocket is, is our eyes we care for our health because without our health there our eyes would have no world so the end of the world um in some sense um For the Sufi mystics, for the Japanese uh, Zen-minded samurai, it was to, they said, if you want eternal life, you got to die before you die. That was kind of like a street thing they would say back in the day in ancient Vedic cultures, you know. Uh, not just Vedic, sorry, uh, Sufi cultures. They were like, you got to die before you die. And people were like, what the f <laughs> People were like, what do you mean i got to die before you die? How's that possible? You mean there's two versions of me alive right now? And then the, the guy who said you got to die before you die started clapping. He's like, you're a genius. Yeah. You know, <laughs> there, are two, there, are two, there, the, there are two selves. So pretty much you can say enlightenment was when the subjective self's nature was comprehended. 
truly and purely prior to the objective nature's dissolution or dismantlement or whatever, however way we're meant to transition out of this world. I can tell you the best way to, you know, to the best way to enjoy a pool party is to dive in. It is to attempt the inevitably unknown exploration that we all will have to confront. The edge of our mind. For me, death is not a tragic thing. It is, it is the most incredible moment of that existence. It is the final point of existence. It will be for me the show. That means I am kind of watching this world and I'm going to... How can I tell you? It's as if I have seen so many dry leaves on the ground get crumbled under the feet of different beings. I have seen so much, so many things come and go that how can we be afraid of death? We're experiencing it all the time. When, when lovers break up, what happens? Subjectively, there's a death. There's a death of what was. You see, they even had, they did these experiments even. They saw couples that stay with each other a long time. They eventually build this collective memory. This collective memory, when they depart, suddenly goes away, becomes inaccessible because their sense of self is not there. You see, the thing with love is that the person you really love, when you're beside them, your sense of self is vibrant. It is, it is alive. You feel alive. You can never some, love something that you, is, you, don't, you don't care about, you know? You only love the things you care about. It is very hard for people. That's why they said the mystics were the lovers of the unknown. They were the ultimate explorers of all the whole moment. They were fearless. They were fearless experimenters of all phenomena. That means the scientist is just taking objective evidence. The yogi is also contemplating subjective evidence. But this subjective evidence comes through an inner structure. So internally you are a world. Your mind is a world. Okay? <clears throat> Think of it this way. The roots of the tree can't be seen, right? When we look at a tree right now, I'm looking at a tree in my yard, the roots can't be seen. The roots are in the soil, but we know there are roots. And we know just like how the roots have branched out, uh, as, as the tree developed, there's this one common trunk, and then it branches out. Okay, it branches out. So this universe, um, people can choose to acknowledge astronomy and uh, in, uh, you know, the, an astrophysics kind of uh, reverence for, for the cosmos. I, I'm totally okay with that. I entertain it myself. But for me, the, the cosmic structure is a tree. You don't understand. It is an incredible tree. The tree is the greatest metaphor. You know, I, I, there, in, in my youth, I remember every time I would go into nature, it was, I, I, I've never hugged a tree. I felt that was unnecessary. <laughs> But I've had moments where I've just gone up to a tree and just put my whole hand on the tree. Just like how you would put your hand on a friend's back on a uh, when, it, when they're in suffering or in something. I've done that with a tree. And when I've done that with the tree, I wasn't experiencing the tree. I was remembering how my experience uh, grew from the same dirt. In some sense, what I'm trying to tell you is that it, this is a very complex, not complex, but I, I think it's very simple actually to acknowledge, but this is how I'm kind of giving a structure to the unknown aspects of our intelligence. I'm saying this moment of being, first let's start off, the first value is a moment of being. This moment of being divides between an external view and an inner view. This external view and this internal sense of being, this external sense of being and internal sense of being, these are both being the same moment, okay? So it's very hard to say that they exist on their own, okay? It's kind of like the yin-yang, the white and black and the yin-yang symbol are the same circle. Do you know what I mean? So are in the same circle. So in some sense, I'm, I'm saying let's just entertain the notion that there is an external reality and there is an inner reality. If there is something that is real, we will see wherever reality is, a self soon follows, so in, in regards to external reality, suddenly the individual consciousness has even a space to formulate, okay? But internally, 
The way our individuality arises is based on the need of the external. That means you are as human as required to acknowledge the human, the human behavior and uh, all this stuff. Do you know what I mean? So external view, objective, internal view, subjective. Internal view, subjective, unknown. External view, objective, known. We can know the objective, uh, objective reality. Okay? <laughs> so, how am I relating this structure that I just explained of the external internal phenomena, uh, uh, this kind of dynamic, with a tree? How am I relating it to a tree? I'm saying we are exactly the surface of the soil. So, we are like the tr this physical reality is the trunk. Okay, it is one singular dimension. It's just one one display. Okay, but uh, the branches of it is the infinitude of all the various ways that design exists. Internally, is the roots of the external world. That's what I'm telling you, and the roots are not visible by the surface. So you can never expect your conscious mind to acknowledge the unconscious because if it does, it will not exist. You're asking a part of your consciousness to experience non-existence, okay? And that, that it won't happen. Your ego can't dismantle itself. This is why the ego doesn't trick you. The ego doesn't want to die, okay? Because the ego is animated with the way your mind sees intelligence. You see? <laughs> The last part of what I said might be a bit kind of like foggy, but what I'm trying to say is that um, the feet of the person in the fog are on firm ground. For me, it's like um, I feel we're all acting. We're all acting as the ideas we have in various moments. Just like various particles, these like the atoms that I am right now, do you know they're ancient, similar to yours? We are star stuff, as if energy does not get created or destroyed, so it's all just a change of the same force, as if scientists don't realize when they said energy doesn't get created or destroyed, you know what that implied? That implied the circle around the yin-yang symbol. That, that implied any sort of notion we have is being kept by an attributeless presence. That's what energy is. You tell me. It's changing all the time, and, but it doesn't get created or destroyed. If you notice, what, what gets created or destroyed is usually things with form. So when your intelligence wonders about the formless, it will eventually discover the wa witness within, the watcher within, the observer within. The wise people on this earth um, kiss this world with their eyes with an incredible reverence for the, its possibility of being here. The issue of violence is that it's an ignorance of the value. That means, imagine a violent person is just violent, they, destroy, they kill someone accidentally, okay? The guy's just violent, okay? He does it. And now, this violent criminal suddenly realizes, holy shit, he killed somebody who could take us to, for example, uh, like different galaxies or something. Like it was the kind of guy in charge of that project or whatever. So you see what I'm telling you? It's the notion of it, it's not worth the collective ignorance just because our individual violence. Like the anger is never a reason to disturb the innovation of the modern times. Anger, especially inspired by the past. I think people should get fined if they're angry in public. I firmly believe this. They should get fined. If the person is too savage and too angry and too violent, the person should get fined. Until they realize the value of civ civility. It took us billions of years to become civilized. What? You know, we're going to be okay with violence in the world? Like, it has to, something has to change. Inevitably, it will. We just can direct where the ship is uh, being pushed by the wind. So uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, I guess I'll end the uh, live stream here.
the past melts into the future, the future melts into the present, the past and the present are seen as generations of the moment, the person, the moment the person realizes they are the moment, they, that's, that's what they begin caring for. You have to start being able to be efficient in your inner experience and then your outer experience follows. Your outer, your out, what, your outer ability is, believe it or not, uh, uh, an effect of your inner state, of how you are seeing the values of the moment being caused. That's where I find intelligence is. But intelligence is too mysterious. It has a, it has a divine aura unknown kind of field of preservation of itself, you know? We are living in an era of ideal worship, so it's kind of like a frozen wasteland of belief systems here, okay? Trust me, uh, we are like robots to one another because we are not honest in society. If we were to think 10,000 years ahead of our time, <clears throat> our grandkids would look at us and be like, our, like children's 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 children of the many future generations would look at us and be like, oh my God, our ancestors were so badass. They, <laughs> they, were, they were trying to see what it would be like to live 10,000 years ahead of their time, you know, and then they get inspired and try to see like 100,000 years ahead of their time. It's all, it's all vision, it's all inspiration, because a lot of the things that actually need to happen on this planet, they take time. They take time, effort, and calibration, and efficient vision. The secret to life is efficient vision. It is the survival of the most efficient vision. That's it. That's the game. We transform the texture of evolution into a subjectively, multidimensionally kind of conceivable domain of kind of, you know, there's many ways the character can play this game in a story it has made. Much blessings and namaste. Within or without, truth is now.